Today's daf we're going to learn is Ketubo, daf Ayin Tet. We're going to start at the bottom in the middle of our story. So we were learning about a woman's property. She brings into a marriage, Nechsem Elog, my property she inherited, received as a gift. When she brings it into the marriage, the husband has rights to the proceeds. I want to just point out one thing before we move on, which is it seems to us as women a little bit unfair. What? He has rights to the land. We don't have rights to the land. So again, I've mentioned this many times, right? Even in America in the late 1800s, women didn't have rights to the land they lived on. But all the more so, I want to point out something else. The fact that the man gets rights to the produce comes with a responsibility. It's the same way she gives up her salary, but she gets food. So she gives up her rights to the produce. But that means that he's responsible for investing in the land. We're going to get to this later that he might even lose his investment in the land. He has to pay money. He has to um, work the land. He has to deal with it, which is a huge responsibility. So there's, there's a flip side to it. And you have to remember, women didn't generally deal with their own land in those days. They were busy with household chores and other things. They weren't necessarily didn't have the, fle- the freedom to be dealing with also the land. So in a sense, it was, it was a two-sided thing here. We're going to see all bunch of things here today that are also two-sided. You have to remember there's both perspectives and there's some things that are in the best interest of both of them. So now we have this woman who clearly, maybe this is why I want, she didn't think this was a good thing. She didn't want her husband to have access to her, the produce of her stuff. So what did she do? She did this fictitious gift to her daughter, gifted it to her daughter, the land, so that it wouldn't be hers and the husband would have no access. In the meantime, she got married to him, she got divorced from him, and then she goes before Rav Nachman. Why did she go before Rav Nachman? Because obviously the daughter said, she wanted the land back from the daughter, and the daughter said, you gave it to me as a gift. What do you mean? You're taking it back? It's not fair. You already gave it to me. So the question is, what happens? Starting now from the top line of our Gemara, of Ayin Tet. So, onto the commander of Nachman. She goes before Rav Nachman. Kare Rav Nachman Lishtara. He tears up the, the document that says that I gave you this as a gift meaning it was a useless document. You know, obviously it wasn't useless. And at the very end of this, the Gemara is going to ask, if it was totally fictitious, then how did it work to avoid the husband taking the payroll? So we're going to have a problem with that because if it really meant nothing, that he could just rip up the star, then theoretically it shouldn't have meant anything for the husband. This husband should have had access. We'll get back to that much later. Well, as a Rav Anan the Kamei Demaruk, Rav Anan saw this and wasn't very happy about it. He goes to Marukva, he says, Did you see Mr. Nachman, right, he doesn't even call him Rav, Mr. Nachman, the, the uh, farmer, okay, he's really putting him down. Did you see how he just ripped up, he tears up deeds of, you know, sale of people or gifts? So Marukva says, there must be more to this than, than what seems to be. Is Emily easy? Tell me really. What exactly happened here? Tell me the details. So they spare us all the details, right? They say, so and so, such and such happened. He says, oh, oh, you're talking about a Ravracha? This is a thing. This isn't just this one woman decided to do it. This is a way people do this, right? Nowadays, people do this all the time, right? They try to claim they don't own land by giving it to somebody else. We all know that it's fictitious, and yet, seems to be allowed. In fact, Rabbi Chanilai Bar Idi said in the name of Shmuel, I am someone who teaches, right, who rules for other people. If anyone ever brings me a shtar mevracha like this, I'll tear it up. It's obviously a fictitious thing. And of course, you can get your land back. Because all you were trying to do was to avoid someone else having access to your land. So, there you see, Nachman did what he did was okay. Amale Rava le Rav Nachman. Now Rav, Rava comes to Rav Nachman with a question about this. Tama Mai, what's the reason you said this? Delo shavik inish nafshe v'yayv la'achurine. The reason why, okay, and, and he's, he really says, let's go back and look at what Shmuel says. And you must have passed in this way because of Shmuel. But what Shmuel was talking about was not a case like ours. He was talking about a case where somebody gave land to somebody else. Like, let's say I wanted to avoid my husband getting access to my land. I gave it to you. So if that's the case, right? I gave it to someone else. Nobody, like, lo shavik inish nafshev yav lachrine. Again, we try to get into the minds of people. Nobody in their right mind would take their land and just give it to somebody else, right? I mean, there are nice people in the world, but 
This is your land. You're not going to just gift it to somebody else. So obviously you didn't really mean it. But what's the difference between that in this case? Hanimile lachrine. That's only to somebody else. Avalabarte yahiva. But maybe to her daughter, she really did mean to gift it. People often give gifts of land to their children. So maybe she really meant to. But what does he answer? Either he answers back, or at least the Gemara is answering for Rav Nachman. Afilu hachi, even so, bimkom barta, even bimkom barta, nafsha adifala. Okay, as much as people are nice and they want to give their children land, in the end, they care more about themselves than they care about their children. And therefore, again, you have to remember, in this case, she's also claiming that she never really meant to give it to her daughter. So therefore, we can assume they, they would take precedence over their children, and even in a case like this, she probably didn't mean it, although we're going to modify this very soon. Maybe. So because of this question we're going to have, we're going to have to modify things a little bit. So in this source it says, okay, This isn't just this woman, but here the bride is giving you advice. If you want to have your, your land avoided being taken over by your husband and having him have rights to it, Kate Sadiosa, you know, by the way, it could be you think your husband's a terrible farmer or doesn't manage things well and you think he'll ruin your property. So, what do you do? According to Rashbag, she can write a Shar Pasim, which is again something very similar. It's Shar Pasim, at least some people say, Piusim. There's different ways to understand this. Piusim means to appease, right? She basically works out this kind of nice kind of star. Listen, I'm going to give this to you with the obvious understanding that I'm going to take it back when I end my marriage. Now, Rashbag would work fine, but we're really bringing the rabbi's opinion because we obviously pass them like the rabbis against Rashbag, and that's going to be a question to Rav Nachman. How did you ignore what the rabbis said here? So the rabbis say, If he wants to, okay, I gave this land to someone, Piusim, if he wants to, he can just play with me, okay? And which basically means he can take the keep the land for himself and he has a he has a star to prove it. So he can basically say, I'm not giving you this back. Unless I write from today until such time that I want. Okay, if she specifies that in the star, then it works. If she doesn't specify and say those words, then it doesn't work. So now Obviously, you don't need to say this, but Tama the katvalehachi only because she, if, only if she writes that specifically. Halo katvalehachi kananu lokech. If not, it sounds like he has a really good purchase. So Rav Nachman, back to you, okay? Or Shmuel, really? It's really a question on Shmuel, who said, "I would rip up any star like this." Seems from here, you wouldn't rip up a star if the if the lokech, the buyer, has rights, or the person who got a gift has rights to it, then. He has rights, then you can't rip it up. <clears throat> so I'm a Rabbi Zera, and this is why I said we're going to qualify this a little bit. Lokashia habakula habimiksata. If you gave all your land to someone, it's obvious you didn't mean it. Okay, whether it's your daughter, whether it's your neighbor, it doesn't make a difference. Nobody gives away all their land and leaves themselves with nothing. But habimiksata, this bright we just quoted, is if you only gave away part of your land. Then they have a claim that you actually gave it to them, and that's legitimate. Okay, I'm gonna buy. Uh, sorry, one last question, which I told you we get back to. Ilo kanan hilokach nikninu ba. If you say, let's say I wrote all my property to my daughter or to you or to whoever it might be, and we just said that, right? It's not valid. I can take it back whenever I want. If that's the case, then theoretically the husband should be able to take it back and say that's my land. And I have access, right? I don't own the land, but I own the payroll, the proceeds. So how does that work? So Amar Abaye, back to this opinion we saw in the Mishnah. They're treated like property that he didn't know about. Remember, we ended yesterday with this explanation of what property he didn't know about. And we said it could be land that's abroad. This is considered like land that's far away that he doesn't know about. And we already said that land that he doesn't know about, right? That's the distinction Rabbi Shimon made. He doesn't get rights to the payroll of the, that kind of land. So this has the status of land he doesn't know about because she fictitiously handed it over to someone else. 
It's as if he doesn't know about it, even if maybe he does know about it. And therefore, right, by leave it to Rabbi Shimon, you have to say, according to Rabbi Shimon, this would only work according to Rabbi Shimon. New Mishnah. Now we start to talk about the payroll. So the, again, the Karen is the principal. That she owns. The payroll, the proceeds are the husband's. Okay? In yesterday's talk, we were talking about, does she have the right? I wanted to clarify this. When, when we talked about land falls to her and then she tries to sell it, she can't sell the rights to the payroll, but she can sell the land itself. The problem here becomes that if she sells the land itself when she's married to the husband, the husband won't be able to access the land to get the payroll, and that's going to preclude him from getting his payroll. And that was the whole problem with this kind of sale. That was the whole question, what property can she sell or not? So now the issue is that two issues, okay, from her perspective and from his perspective. And they're both, in this case, they have the same interest in mind. She wants, at the end of the marriage, to walk out with something. Okay, land is the easiest because land, so he grows things on the land. So he gets everything that grows and she gets the land itself. That's perfect. But what if she goes into the marriage with something that could theoretically disappear, right? It could be used and used up. Now we're going to get into all sorts of problems because if it can get used up, so number one, she's not going to be able to leave the marriage with anything because it's gone. So it's in her best interest not to have items like that that are going to get used up. And he is going to have no proceeds. So it's in his best interest also. So in this case, they actually both have the same interest in mind, which is making sure that there's always a Karen. Okay, so now in order to do this, we have to define, and that's going to be a lot of what today's stuff is, what is considered the Karen and what is considered Peyrot. As long as there's Peyrot still coming, then it's fine to Karen. If what someone might define as payroll, someone else defines as principal, in other words, it's, it's always a, a distinction. What do you call produce and what do you call principal? And then we're going to, if we, if we think it's actually the principal and it might be disappear, then we're going to have to turn it into something that won't disappear. So you'll see more inside, but that's the, the general direction we're going. So the first thing the Mishnah talks about is neflulak safim. She gets money. Now money, we all know, disappears, right? You spend it and it's gone. So yilakach behem karka v'wochel perot. So you turn it into land, basically. What we're going to do is every time we have something, the best idea is to just turn it into land. Buy land with it. And then at the end of the marriage, she'll go out with something. And during the marriage, she'll get the proceeds. Perot hatlushim in karka. Let's say she comes in with a basket of fruits. Okay, a huge basket. I don't know. So, it would have to be a lot if you're going to buy land with it, right? So, again, turn it into land. Otherwise, the fruits will rot. She'll end up with nothing, right? They certainly can't make you something. So, sell them and turn them into land. Now, we're going to have a debate about what the status is. This is where we start getting. Fruits that are attached to the ground at the time of the marriage. So, we get married today. I happen to have lots of fruits attached to the ground. Normally, things that are attached to the ground are like the land itself. But here we're going to see, how do we define this? Like, who's are they? Are they payroll? They're proceeds, right? They, they're things that grew on the land, but they're not detached yet. So, He says, anything attached to the land is like the land, in the sense that they belong to her. She brought it into the marriage. They're not payroll yet. So because they belong to her, but they're movables, they're not, right, they're, they will be movables. So what do we do? We assess right now, what's the value of these fruits today? If I sold the land with the fruits, or I sold the land without the fruits, right? Theoretically, I could go and say, I'm selling you this land, but all the fruits that are in it right now are mine. I'm keeping for myself. So you see the price difference. You take that amount of money and you invest it in land. And then because it's hers, so turns into new nixen load, right? That is land, and he'll get the proceeds. We call those payroll. They're payroll. Right? What else is payroll if not payroll? Right? These are fruits. So anything that's gr that's growing now, that's already grown, is his. Okay, he's going to get them. Only things that are detached from the ground are hers, like the earlier part of the Mishnah said. And then we're going to repeat what the earlier part of the Mishnah said. If they're detached, again. On the day of the marriage, she already has detached fruits in her hands. Those are nichsen belog, and those we have to turn into land. 
So again, those, Yilakach Bem Karka Vuochel Pirot. Okay, so those are turned into land, but the ones in the land itself just belong to him. They're Pirot. Okay? Rabbi Shimon Omer. Now, Rabbi Shimon, until we get to the very end of the section, the section in the Gemara, we're not going to understand exactly how he differs. From Chachamim, it looks like he's saying the same thing, although what he says is very confusing sounding. Rabbi Shimon Omer, it's so confusing that the Mishnah is going to actually explain what he's saying. He says this cute kind of thing. Makom when things are good for him, meaning it goes to him when he goes into the marriage, it's going to go to her when the marriage is over. And as we assess what it is at the time of the marriage, we assess what it is at the, time, the day of the divorce, and things that would go to him on the day of the marriage will end up going to her on the day of the divorce. And makom if when she got married, um, it's not going to be good for him. He's not going to get it on the day of the wedding. He will get that same item on the day of the divorce. So how does this work? Okay, because that was very unclear. Ketzad. Perot hamechubarim lakarka. Okay, now this is sounding like Tanakam, uh, like Chachamim. Because what the Chachamim say? Perot that are attached to the ground. Biknisata shelo. They go to him, right? They're his, they're Perot. If they're payroll, when they're attached to the ground and they become his on the day of the wedding, on the day of the divorce, if there are fruits attached to the ground, she gets it. She walks out of the marriage with it. Okay, this is a, a very fair thing he's saying, basically. So now we understand it. What he's basically saying is, right, if they're detached from the ground, and we say on the day of the wedding, she had all this detached fruit, that's hers, that's her nichse melok, Anything that was detached from the ground before the day of the divorce goes to him. Okay, so it's very fair. We're going to be consistent kind of in our approach. I'm not going to say one has the advantage over the other. It's just going to say it's this for the marriage. It'll go to him. On the day of the divorce, it'll go to her or the reverse. So again, where he differs from the Chachamim, we're going to have to explain in the Gemara because it sounded very similar to what Chachamim said, although Chachamim did not elaborate as much. Therefore, we're going to find a certain point where they disagree. Now the Gemara talks about, let's say, here's like interesting financial advice, okay? If the husband and wife have a disagreement, what did it say in the Mishnah? Her nichs and malog, we want to turn into land. Now, it doesn't mean only land. It means turn it into something that can produce fruits, or, right, fruits in the, right, quote-unquote fruits. Obviously, we don't mean only fruits. We mean any sort of proceeds. So the Gemara says, pshita ara ubate. If one of them wants to buy land and the other one says, no, 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 I want to buy a house with this money. All right. Land is always better than a house. Why? Because a house, you spend money on, on all sorts of things that eventually will go bad. You'll have to redo them. You'll have to, you know, they'll just be destroyed. It's not as good an investment as land. Land is always going to stay land. It's always a good investment. Okay. Not always, but okay. Bate vidikle bate. If one wants uh, to buy a house with it, and one wants to buy a palm tree, well, house is a better investment. Dikle ilane, if it's a choice between a palm tree and other trees, dikle, because a dekel tree is much more solid. Ilane vikufane, trees or vines, ilane. Okay, trees are more, are, are more likely to give fruits than a vine. So basically, those are your choices. Now we get to um, a question about what, in certain cases, we're going to try to define what is considered the Karen and what is Peirot. So if you have Abba Zardata, Upere Dikfale. Okay, so Abba Zardata is, a, is an orchard with trees that give like little apple, tr little apples that are not really so great. And in general, they use it more for, it's a, called Hawthorn, Hawthorn trees, according to the Koran. And they produce much more, like it's usually, the fruits are very minimal, okay? And Rachi says, Lo haya periyang chashuv lahem. And they usually cut it for the, for, the, for, the, for the wood, okay? Which means that it's going to eventually disappear, okay? And what about a, a pool of fish? Fish pool also, eventually there'll be no more fish left. So the question is, so Rashi says the question is like this. If they fall as an inheritance, okay, the woman has these, does she need to sell them? Because is there 
the keren, and then these, this, the fish are the produce, or the, the fruits are the produce, and then it's fine because there's a, still produce, or do we say because there's not a lot of produce, then maybe not? Others say that the question is, um, is this something that you can actually purchase? Remember we said, we were just talking about what they can purchase if she has cash she brings in. So she has to purchase lamb with it. Can she purchase these things? Are these considered that they have a good enough produce or not really? Because they're not going to produce. There's a limit to what they're going to produce. So because of that, so what do they say? Amre la peyre, amre la carna. Some people say that there is payroll here. These are payroll. Some people say, no, this whole thing is the Karen. And therefore, again, if the whole thing is the Karen and there isn't really produce, then you're going to have to sell it and turn it into something else. Okay. Or if you want to buy this with your stuff, you can't do that. Klala de Milta. So now the, the second opinion who says it's a Karen explains. Giz omachlif peyro. If you cut it and it'll grow back, that's called peyro. But ein gizomachlif, like this case, where you're going to cut it and it's not going to grow back the way it was before, then it's karna. And then it's not considered peyrot. And then again, it won't work here. Amar Rabbi Zera, Amar Rabbi Yashai, Amar Rabbi Yanai, Amar Rabbi Abba, Amar Rabbi Yashai, Amar Rabbi Yanai. Okay, whoever said it in the name of Rabbi Yashai, in the name of Rabbi Yanai, one of them either Rabbi Zera or Rabbi Abba. Now we're turning to Amudet. Hagonev Vlad Behemat Milog. Now we're going to get into offspring. So, she brings in an animal, and the animal has another animal. That would be payroll, right? Those go to the husband, presumably. But now it seems like it doesn't go to the husband because they say if somebody stole it, okay, they stole the offspring of the animal of her nichse melog, mishalem tashlum laisha. The woman gets the double payment that the robber has to give her. So now if you look in Rashi for a minute, on the first, the second Rashi on the page, first line in Rashi, he doesn't get it. At this point in the Gemara, they think, they think that why does the woman get it? Because the Vlad is not offspring that you would think. It's not produce, something that the animal produced. It's still part of the Karen. Now, why on earth would you say this? Of course it's produce. What's produce if not that? Well, no, because... It's the Karen and, and Yilakach Ben Karka. Theoretically, she should turn that into land, is what they think. Again, we're going to change this later. Again, what's the whole theory? That if you're going to lose the Karen over the long term, then what it produces all becomes part of the Karen. Because, right, eventually your animal's going to die. So whatever the animal produces, which is other animals, are also part of the Karen so that she doesn't get left without anything, and he doesn't get left without anything. Which means that if we view this as the Karen, it means that she's the owner, and that's why she gets the Kefa. So that's what they think right now, to which the Gemara says, if so, Kiman, lo ke Rabbanan, lo ke Hananya. Now, we didn't see yet Rabbanan and Hananya. We're going to see them right now. So don't think, oh, where did Hananya appear? But this is obviously going to be, and now we're going to have a problem, because this doesn't hold like Rabbanan, it doesn't hold like Hananya. You both have a machloket about the status of offspring, okay? We're gonna decide, talk about offspring of servants, slaves, and we're gonna talk about, which are Canaanite slaves, and we're gonna talk about offspring of animals. So, Ditanya. Vlad behemat milog labaal, Vlad shivchat milog lisha. According to Tanakama, we distinguish between the Vlad of, of slaves and the Vladot of animals. The Vladot of animals belong to the husband, which already goes against what we just said. And the offspring of the slaves goes to the woman. We don't yet know why. We're going to have to explain the Gemara. Hanan ben Achiyoshia amal asu vlad shivcha melog kivlad behemat melog. No, there's no distinction between them. All of them go to the husband. So now we have a problem because why does the kefil go to her if everybody says that the animal is owned by the husband? If he own, right again, what does it mean owned? So this is exactly the tricky part. He has rights to the proceeds. That means the offspring are his to use and to benefit from. So if they get stolen, shouldn't the kefil go to him? To which the Gemara says, Afilu Forget that it's part of this machloka and maybe it sides like one or the other. No, no, no. I can explain both of them and explain still, even according to both opinions, the kefil is going to go to the woman. Why? Peire takinu rabanan. Peire de peire lo takinu rabanan. 
they gave him rights to the, the produce. So what does that mean? He has rights to the animal. He doesn't have rights to any benefit gained by, now, obviously the animal is his, so he'll get the single payment, but, it, but, uh, but the payment of the kefel, right, what happens? I steal something from you, I have to pay double. The extra part, the kefel, is just an extra payment that's a penalty for me. The penalty goes to her. The value of your animal that he stole is going to obviously go back to the husband because that was his. But the proceeds from that, now it's not exactly proceeds, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but the proceeds from that, he doesn't get. He doesn't get proceeds from the proceeds, okay? He gets the proceeds, but not the proceeds from the proceeds. Now, it's not exactly true. He does get the proceeds from the proceeds, and we're going to see a different story about that later. But that's different than this. Why? If he grows, uh, he has huge crop one year, and he takes that money, and he buys with it new land, and that land makes money, he gets the proceeds of that. That's peri to peri. This is a little bit different, because that's taking exactly what it was and making profit from it. That goes to him. But you know, if he takes his profits, and he makes profits from that. This is not the same thing. This is where, because of some external thing, somebody stole it, there's going to be profits made on it, that goes to her. Okay, so there's a bit of a distinction between this thing about peri to peri. I don't even, when you get there, to the, when we learned about peri to peri, right, it seems to contradict, but it does, because it's different. So now, again, they say he could be the owner of it. Again, he's not really the owner. If you think about it, she's the owner. He just has rights to the offspring. So his rights to the offspring, they were limited. He doesn't get the careful for it, because that all comes from her. Now, Bishlam al now we have to explain the machloka between them. Chananya makes sense. Hainu du lo chashina lemita. Because he's not concerned in either case. That, in other words, again, what's the concern we talked about before? Maybe the shifcha will die and therefore we'll have nothing left, right? But he's not concerned for that possibility. Or maybe the animal will die and she'll have nothing left. And therefore, again, if we were concerned for the possibility of death, what would we say? Even the offspring is considered the karen. And then what should she do, really? Sell it, buy land with it, and then he can get the proceeds of the land. Hanani doesn't say that in either case because he's not concerned about death. Elila Rabbanan doesn't make any sense. Why would you distinguish between the slave and the animal? If you're worried that the slave is going to die and you'll end up with nothing, and that's why Chachamim said, the vlad of the shifrat melog, the offspring, any children she has goes to the woman. Well, then, why would you distinguish? The animal also, you should be worried the animal will die, in which case the vlad should go to her as well. And then if you're not worried about death, then you should hold like Hananya, who says they're both the same and they all go to the husband. So it doesn't really make sense. So what do they explain? We are worried that they might die. But what's the difference between the animal and a slave? When the animal's dead, there's still some value left. You can sell the hide, do things with it. It's not the same. This goes back to the thing with the trees and the fish, right? They might not be the same. They might not be, it's not a huge profit they're going to make. But there is something still left that you can do something with. So she'll still be left with something. As long as there's something that she's left with, anything that comes from it will be called payroll. If there's nothing for her, like a dead slave woman is not useful at all, can't do anything with that, therefore her offspring is going to be considered her own. Because the, you understand the caring continues as long as there is no, as long as the, if the caring is going to disappear, then any profits or proceeds or things that come from it are actually going to be hers. And then again, she'll have to go back to the Mishnah. She'll have to turn that into land so that the husband can get proceeds from something. And that way we retain the principle while yet having payroll. So that's the distinction between them. We actually hold like Hananya, that we don't consider the animal's hide as something, and therefore it's going to actually be, right, and, and we're actually not worried about it dying. That's really the truth. We're not worried about it dying at all. That's not a concern. We assume she'll still have the animal. Amarava, Amarav Nachman, Afagav de Amar Shmuel, Halacha Kehananya, even though Shmuel said this, Mode Hananya, Sheim Nidgarsha, no tenet amim venotatan, Mipne Shevach Betavia. Even though Hananya says 
uh, okay, even though Shmuel holds like Hananya, and Hananya says that he gets the offspring, he says, however, Hananya will agree that in the event of divorce, okay, since these are things that were in her family for, could be for generations, I don't know what, but he, since these were part of her father's, her household's items, Okay, her slaves. Now, some people say this is only talking about slaves. Some people say it's all talking about animals. It's interesting. You have to think about why one would say one or the other. It makes sense that there would be a bit of a distinction here that we've shown him. Just, it's not clear. Let's start with the slave woman. If this family of slaves was always in her family for years, right? So she can claim at the end of the marriage, I want the offspring back. She has to pay for them because they're his right to have them, but it's her right to actually take them out of the marriage debate about whether this is also true for animals or not because right do people have this again is it sentimental value is it that you know maybe it was a very strong right they had good genes in their family maybe the animals also these were animals that were very solid and they've been with our family and you know first of all it doesn't have to be it was with the family for generations it could just be one was with the family but that was important enough that she can have the rights to buy it back she still has to pay for it because it's not hers because it was proceeds but she does have the right to demand it back um, for pay. She gave him a goat. She brought into the marriage a goat that they would milk. Rachel a sheep that they would shear. Tarnigol at lebetzata, a hen for her eggs. Dekel a perotav, a palm tree for the fruits. Ochel v'holech ad shetichle hakeren. He can benefit, and that is, he can eat and take the eggs and take right the the milk and all that, even though eventually. There might not be anything left. Okay? Now, why is this? So, if you look at Rashi, Rashi explains. It's because it's much higher up on the page. About 10 lines down from the top. There's still the hide of the animal. There's feathers that you can do something with. There's still the, the trunk. In other words, these things might disappear, but there's always something left to them that you could do something with. Again, this goes with, as long as there's small value left, it's still something. Otherwise, we'd say that you'd have to sell the fruits and turn it into land, and that would be the, the you know the new Karen, and he would get payroll from that. I'm Rav Nachman. Okay, I want you to remember this opinion of Rav Nachman because it's going to come up later, much later, where someone's going to say the opposite of this, and then they're going to say, "Didn't Rav Nachman say this?" Okay, so you'll remember this. Okay, when we get there, um, I'm Rav Nachman. She brings into the marriage a cloak. Peire, have, uh, okay, Peire. This has Peirot. What does that mean? He can wear this cloak, just like the, the A's Lechava until really the A's can't even bring any, give any milk anymore. Same thing here. He can wear this cloak. Okay? He has access to her Nechzemelog during the marriage, even if it's not land that he's working he can wear the cloak the whole marriage even if it gets it turns into shreds because again shreds of a cloak are worth something a lot but they're worth something this totally gets knocked out later on in the Gemara and Dafkuf Aleph they say no and I want you to know this because it's very hard when you get something in your head it's hard to forget about it so if Nixon Malog it sounds like he has access to all the Nixon Malog later we're going to see no Nixon Malog that can get worn worn out like a cloak, he actually is not allowed to use them or touch them during the marriage. He has no access to them because he might destroy them and they're hers to take out when right. So if it's a field, he works the field. If it's a cloak, basically he can't. Okay? So again, our Mishnah said turn it into something, but it sounds like you don't have to turn everything into something. And it's a good question where you draw the line there. But a cloak, he doesn't he really can't use her Nixon Malog. Okay, which is different from the Nixay Tzom Barzo. Okay, maybe it's a good place to discuss this so you remember the distinctions. Nixay Malog, basically, okay, and I always remember it, right? Heirloom. You bring it into the marriage and you take it out as is. So that's why if he ruins it, right, he can't really do that. Nixay Tzom Barzo, he basically, we evaluate how much is it worth now. And when the marriage ends, he has to give me back that amount. Ideally, he gives me back the object, but he doesn't have to give me back the object. He could just give me back money, the value at whatever value we assessed it at the time. Barzell is something with a stable value. And therefore, what it's going to stay stable, whatever, even if it doesn't stay stable, I'm going to get it back at the value I brought it in. 
because of that, it doesn't really matter if he destroys the cloak. So he can use Nechzei Tzom Barzo. They're his to use as he pleases. Because he's committed, this is what we say, and this goes to like Bava Metzia, where we talk about who's responsible for what. He takes on responsibility, which means that he can then use it and do what he wants with it, but he's assumed responsibility. Whereas Ixay Malogi hasn't assumed responsibility because she gets it at whatever state it is when it leaves the marriage. So, right, if I take out my heirloom and it's destroyed at this point, that's my problem, not his. I assumed responsibility during the marriage. And that's why he doesn't have access to it. Makes a lot of sense. Rav Nachman is a little more difficult. Why can he use it? But his theory is as long as there's a little bit of it left, we're not worried about, right, the issue here is destroying the Karen. As long as there's something left, it's not considered destroying any kind of access. So, Kiman. Who does this go according to? Ki hai tana de tanya, the tana that appears here. Hamelach vahachol hareze perot. If you have a, a place where there's a lot, where they mine for salt or sand, then, right, you have a piece of land that's, you know, on the beach and it has tons of sand. And hareze perot. That's perot because there's always more salt, there's always more sand. Pil shel gaflit, if you have a quarry of sulfur, or machporet shel tzarif, or a mine of alum, that, we're going to have a machloket. Rabbi Meir, Omer, Keren. Those eventually get finished. Okay, it's not, there's a finite amount. So once you finish mining it, there's nothing left. So he says, that whole thing is Keren and not Peiro. And again, then you would have to basically sell it and turn it into something that will stay. Chachamim omrim Peiro. The rabbis say it's Peiro. So that would match Rav Nachman, who says that the glima is Peiro. Okay? And therefore he has access to it. Last part for this Mishnah, Rabbi Shimon Omer, Makam Shiafekocho, right? And then it's good. He has the advantage, the upper hand in the beginning. She has the upper hand when it leaves. Like, for example, we said, Peroda Machubarim Lakark, right? They're his when they go into the marriage and they become hers when they leave the marriage. So that sounded just like Chachamim. Rabbi Shimon Hainu Tanakama, Amarava Machubarim Bishat Yitzia Ikabinai. The rabbis only talked about what's the status of fruits that are attached to the ground when we got married. And that, the rabbi said, goes to him. Rabbi Shimon comes and says, not only do they go to him when the marriage starts, but because they go to him when the marriage starts, if there's fruits attached to the ground when the marriage ends, it goes to her. But the rabbis must disagree with that and think that they go to him also. And anything attached to the ground, because it's produce that he produced during the marriage, he's going to get it even though it's attached to the ground on the day of the divorce. So that's the machloka between the rabbis and Rabbi Shim. New mission. Naflula avadim ushvachot skini. What if, okay, before we talked about a shivcha that was not old, but now we have a slave or a slave woman who are very old. So they're not worth a lot, but whatever they're worth, they sell them, they buy something that's going to last, because again, this, she's going to die, and then she'll end up with nothing. So better to turn it into something that will remain. Rashbag Omer, lo timko, mipneshen shevach beit avia. Rashbag disagrees and says, no, these are part of her family's property, and you don't just sell a slave woman she's, or, or a slave. They're part of her stuff from her father. She doesn't have to sell them. Again, this means, lo timkor, by the way, is not that it's saying if he insists on selling it because he wants produce, he insists on selling it, she doesn't have to agree. Naflala zeitim, ugfanim zkenim. What if it's olive trees that are going old and you know going bad? They won't last very long. Or old vineyards. Yimachu v'yilakach mehem karkavu chel perot. Same debate here. Okay, except instead of Rashbag, it's going to be Rabbi who disagrees. So again, turn it into land, sell it for whatever it's worth, buy land with it. Rabbi Yehuda Omer lo timkor mipnei shem shavak beitavia. Again, same idea. They're part of their fa- their family's property. You can't sell it. Amarav kahana amarav. Machloket, the machloket between them, is shenafluba sadeshela. It's only if the zetim and the, the vineyards and the olive trees were in her property. Aval besadeshe ena shela divrei akol timkol mishkum de kakal yakarna. Let's say she had uh, she bought trees that were in your field. So all I own is the trees. I don't own the land. The point is, if my trees die or my vineyard dies, I still have land. I still have something. So I'm not left with nothing. But if I only bought rights to the trees, and now the trees are dying, then everyone agrees that that I would have to sell it. I would have to agree. However, Matkefla Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef, how could you possibly say that? That they all agree in a case that 
it's in a different field that makes no sense with the beginning of the Mishnah. Now, they don't live in a field, right? If they die, there's nothing left. So it would be similar to It's just like a field that's not hers. And they have a machlok. So you can't say they don't argue in that case. So therefore, they change what Rav Kana said. El iet marhach iet marama Rav Kana marav. Rav Kana said in the name of Rav. Machloket b'sadeh she'en ashala. The machloket is specifically in the case where she doesn't own it. And then the whole debate is, and that's what we thought it was, which is even though there'll be nothing left, do we for right? Since there'll be nothing left, we force her to sell it. Or even though there'll be nothing left, we still can't force her to sell it because of Shev Betavia. This is something that came from her family. We can't insist that she sell it if she doesn't want. But when do they all agree? It's in her own field. If it's in her own field, they all agree she doesn't have to sell because it's her own family's land and she there will be land left. So, of course, she doesn't need to sell it. Mishnah. And what this will finish for today. Now we get to what I mentioned before, which is he's spending money on this. So he invests a lot of money in her land. Let's say he invests a thousand dollars in her land. Hotzi Harbe, so we spent a thousand dollars, the Achal Kima. And before the marriage right, the marriage ends ends up ending in the first year, let's say, and all his benefit is let's say a hundred a hundred dollars worth. Or Kima Bachal Arbe, or he invested a hundred dollars and he came out with a thousand dollars of produce before the marriage ended. Masha Hotzi Hotzi or Masha Achal Achal. This is it. Whatever happened, happened. He lost his investment. He gained way more. That's just what it is. His rights are that he invests, he gains. Gains are his. She doesn't have any right to them. He doesn't have any right to get back his investment. That's it. But, what if he invested a lot of money or any money and never benefited not a single bit? So we're going to have to see what's, that's what it say before in the Mishnah. He ate a little bit, even if he ate a teeny bit. What's a teeny bit? We'll have to define that. will be the first question of the Gemara that we'll get to today. But what does it say here? If he invested and saw no proceeds, got no proceeds whatsoever, Yishava Kamahotzi. He has to swear about how much he spent because no one was watching. Nobody took care. You know, they didn't have receipts in those days. So he has to swear how much he spent, Vito, and he gets back his entire investment. Only in the case he saw no proceeds. This we'll talk about a lot more in tomorrow's day. Vikama kima, so how much is a little bit? Amarabiasi, afilu gorgeret achat, even one small dried up fig, that's enough. Vuhusha achala, dried up, dried is good actually, but a dried fig. Vuhusha achala derech kavod, but only if he ate it in a respectful manner. And if he ate it at his table, as opposed to, let's say, nibbled on the field, okay, but if he ate it in a, in a way that he looked like he was enjoying it, then that's enough, okay? Any less than that, he gets his money back, any that or more, he doesn't get anything back. Okay? So that's a bit of a risk that he takes in this whole process, which is, you know, again, part, you know, oftentimes, I mean, sometimes he might die, but it, the divorce is actually in his control. You can imagine that he might push off a divorce because he wants to wait till he gets pro- proceeds. It's a little bit tricky, the whole business. Anyway, we're going to stop here and uh, wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom. Recording stop.